Please welcome to the stage Roger Cohen, Athens Democracy Forum host and OPEC columnist, The New York Times, together with his panel. Hello everyone. Uh, uh, welcome back to the Athens Democracy Forum 2.0, new and improved and ever more relevant um, to the challenges of democracy today, just so eloquently expressed by President Tusk, uh, politics understood as war. Uh, we are becoming increasingly familiar with that in the United States these days. Um, I'm very happy um, to welcome up here three uh, distinguished uh, panelists, um, Wole Soinka, playwright, poet, novelist, first African recipient of the Nobel Prize for Literature back in the 1980s. Uh, Ori Okolo, digital disruptor par excellence, um, managing director Africa of Luminate, an activist, a lawyer, and a member of the Kofi Annan Foundation Commission on Elections and Democracy in the Digital Age. And finally, Magdalena Adamovic, member of the European Parliament and the widow of Pavel Adamovic, the late mayor of Gdansk, a liberal, as Mr. Tusk just said, savagely murdered earlier this year. Um, Magdalena, perhaps I could begin with you. Um, what happened to Poland? Um, 30 years ago, no country wanted more to be part of the West, to be part of democracy, to join NATO, to join the European Union. And now we see wide swathes of Polish society describing Europe and the West as decadent, as the place where family and the church and God go to die, and striking off in a different illiberal path that your late husband stood against. So how did this come about? Why did this happen in Poland, do you think? That's, that's a very uh, difficult question, it's, is it? That's not an easy question, um, but um, as in many countries, uh, Polish people are very divided. So even in families, as Donald Tusk said, uh, Tusk said um, brothers versus brothers, uh, when they start to talk uh, about politics, they started to hate each other. And I think we have diagnosed our liberal democracy is in danger uh, because of uh, populist and nationalist. But the question is what we can do about this and what, what is the reason why, why we have this danger. That's are the question I think we can all together uh, find the solution about that. Do you blame these populists and nationalists for the murder of your husband? As I, as I said before, I'm, I have campaigned imagine there is no hate and I'm not blaming you know, anyone personally, even the man who, who killed my husband. And I don't feel any hate for him. But I am really angry with the system and with the allowance, because in Poland we have um, public allowance for the hate speech. So we have this uh, hatred act and crime, and there were no consequences. So police and our prosecutors and judges, well, they didn't do anything. So you're very much in favor and you're pushing for much tighter controls, whether on social media or elsewhere, on hate speech. Do you worry that this could eventually impinge free speech in general? We in the United States are very, very wary always of limits on freedom of expression. I mean, I'm just on the beginning of my way, of, of, of this way, but what I already noticed there is plenty of people trying to define what the hate speech is. 
because we don't have any legal definition of it. And the problem is that, as you said, it's a very, very thin border between hate speech and the freedom of a speech and the freedom of expression, which is, which is fundamental rights in democratic countries, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I hope that within European Parliament and Commission, we can try to define mm -hmm. and to, um, to uh, put a proposition for some a good practice, conduct of good practice, to, to know how to, how to define it. Okay. But what is important, we have to educate people, especially young people, but also teachers, educators, parents, all of us. And we have to start from ourselves. We have to look at the, at the mirror every, every morning and, you know, think well, about uh, hate mm -hmm. and in the evening the same because we, we, we should brush <laughs> our teeth twice to, to look and think what I did today for my democracy because democracy is not giving for forever so we have to take care of it, you know, we okay. have to nourish it. Nourish it. Well, if I could bring you in, um, in your I was reading your, your speech back in, I think, 1986, uh, when you were the recipient of, first African recipient of the Nobel Prize, and you were inveighing in passionate and very moving terms about apartheid uh, in South Africa. Um, now in South Africa, um, there's a democracy, albeit one with huge problems. Um, there is uh, a black prime minister, Cyril Ramaphosa. Um, looking back at, sort of over the sweep of decades, do you, do you feel that the fears about democracy today are exaggerated and that in fact in the course of your lifetime, albeit with, um, with setbacks and great difficulties, particularly in the last decade, um, do you still feel confident um, about the future of democracy? Um, it's a difficult question. I feel confident about the future of democracy. You know, democracy, I think the problem with democracy right now is that it's uh, too laid back. Too what? Too laid back. Can you bring the mic a little laid closer? Laid back. Yeah. Too, um, is it on? It's on, but yes. just bring it a little closer to... Yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's too laid back. Mm -hmm. it, it exists almost in virtual space. Uh, I'm very glad that I caught the, um, uh, the last part of the uh, message from the Secretary General of UNO, that, uh, where uh, she said that democracy is, doesn't even feature uh, as one of the, in any part of the codicils of the formulation of the, and the protocols of the United Nations. In other words, Everybody is free today, especially governments, repressive governments. They are free to define democracy their own way. The, the rules are not there, and yet they're so obvious. It's, it's quite transparent. There, if, for instance, to cite my own country, not so long ago, uh, an incoming uh, president, of course, a former military officer, said, uh, where in effect, he was saying that where the security of the nation is concerned, I will trample on democracy. Um, in other words, <clears throat> I will just forget all about the rule of law if I feel that the security of the nation is, in other words, is given We're growing conditions. familiar with that in the United yes, States. Yes, I'm talking yeah, about yeah, the, yeah, even the yeah. present one. And of course, it's followed by actions like uh, refusing bail to individuals uh, accused of being granted bail by the courts. In other words, demolishing one of the pillars of democracy, if not the major pillar, the judiciary. And that spreads, that spreads downwards. You mentioned South Africa just now. Look at the wave of xenophobia which is going on there and the language followed naturally by actions mm -hmm. against so-called strangers, who are not really strangers, mm -hmm. in South Africa. Most of this has to do with the kind of leadership 
with the kind of pronouncements or lack the lackadaisical approach of leadership towards the emotive conditions, even including even the transferred violence Speaks. of a discontented, of a discontented uh, people. Speaking of emotive uh, conditions, I saw in a conversation earlier this year that you had with the New York, that was printed in the New York Review, that you were asked if President Trump is a racist. And you said, yes, um, no question, he is a racist. And uh, you referred to the president's allusion to shithole countries and his identification of those countries. Um, so in the United States of America, uh, how does it come about that um, a racist president, in your description, uh, has the following of tens of millions of Americans and was elected to the Oval Office. And what does this induce in you? What is what? What, is what, what does this development make you feel, induce in you? The uh, um, United States is a center of contradictions. It's an enigma in many ways. Here is the supposed leader of the democratic world. A beautiful enigma? Here, here is the... A beautiful the, enigma? <laughs> I'm talking about <laughs> the government now, you know. Yeah, okay. Supposedly the of the democratic world. Yeah. And what are the policies of that government in relation to questionable democracies? One of the strongest allies of the United States is one of the most democratically backward nations in the world. I'm talking about Saudi Arabia. And it's that kind of confidence in the powers of an ally that leads eventually, for instance, to the brutal murder of, the, of Khashoggi in uh, a different country uh, by agents of a government who, who feel that, well, maybe there'll be a little hue and cry, but they have a backing. So democracy... Well, Saudi Arabia will host the G20 meeting next year. I mean, how does this happen? How does something as unconscionable as a citizen walking into his consulate and coming out cut up in pieces, how does this have zero, but zero consequences in today's world? You know, sometimes we think of democracy strictly in terms of the, bo of the borders where a government operates. But for me, democracy has to be treated globally. The very attitude of even practicing democracies towards obviously democratically criminal countries assists in eroding the very practice of democracy outside the borders of countries. It, it's happened to, yeah, I can name numbers of, uh, take for instance Idi Amin's uh, Uganda. Idi Amin was able to commit the unbelievable atrocities simply because he always made sure he kowtowed to certain countries at certain times. And so, if you recall, at one time he was an ally of uh, PLO, ally of Israel, ally of Soviet Union, ally of the uh, United States. I mean, he just played all these powerful nations, bodies, movements, like yo-yo. In the meantime, of course, democracy was totally killed in that country, where he was cavorting all over the nation, being toasted. Do you think it's important when the, the President of the United States is perceived as embracing dictators around the world, having much more reserved feelings about um, democratic leaders, and the United States is perceived as having pretty much abandoned any pretense toward being uh, the upholder of certain values, be it liberty, the rule of law, human rights around the world. When there's that abdication by the United States, perceived at least, um, is that grave for the world? It is grave. Let me tell you what I was thinking as I came along, just thinking of what yeah. we will be discussing here. Mm. And I suppose because we were coming to Athens, the acknowledged uh, seat of structured democracy in the world, I thought maybe it's just about time that we started a kind of counter-Olympics, a competition among the, the least democratic nations <laughs> in the world every year. And certainly right now, the United States would qualify 
to be the representative of the Americas. <laughs> no, simply because of this gentleman who just been speaking of. You mean it, oh, Mr. You're, Trump, you're, you're suggesting over Venezuela, for example? Oh, oh, yeah. oh, in the Americas? I, I, I think if, if we just awarded the, um, not the golden palm, I, I, what's the opposite of gold these days? I can't <laughs> quite remember. To, well, I mean, we have a competition, yeah. representative of each yeah, continent, right. and then a vote is taken. And for that year, it doesn't matter what claims the nation yeah. makes. The conduct of that nation, both within and outside, would be total, totaled up. Right. And then we'll have the champion anti-democratic nation of the year. I think well, it's the first prize could be long, long weekend in a Trump resort or something oh, like sorry. that. Yeah. <laughs> so as long as Trump is there, believe me, you're going to yeah. come first in the United Thank States. Thank you. No Ori, sorry, you've been, you've been very patient. Um, um, so it might be a coincidence, but it strikes me that democracy began to decline or enter crisis more or less when you left Harvard. Um, is, there, is, there some, uh, is there some link between the two? And I think so. Um, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> no, I'd actually like to, to respond to a question you asked. You know, it's quite interesting to me, um, the framing of the U.S. now as being particularly tolerant of uh, um, undemocratic regimes. Uh, I think what you have is a very transparent president. Um, the U.S. has always had double standards in other parts of the world. Um, and, and the fact that you have a president now who's very clear on the quid pro quo, on America first, uh, he's just less nuanced about it than previous regimes. And, you know, it's really interesting. I think democracy, you asked, you know, is it particularly... Are we over-exaggerating the crisis? I, I do think there is a crisis, but I do think we're being a bit ahistorical. Um, you know, segregation was practiced in a democratic America um, and many other contradictions. So I think if you ask people who've been marginalized um, in many parts of the world, they've always seen the flaws uh, in quote-unquote democracy democratic regimes or governance or systems is only now when it begins to affect uh, the people who are comfortable mm -hmm. uh, in particular. It's, it's a big crisis. So I think there's always been flaws. Uh, perhaps it's just now reaching... So we shouldn't reason. exaggerate, in a way, the current state of affairs? No, I, th I think if you, if, if, yeah. again, if you study, there's always an ebb and a flow, and then yeah. now we're in, we're in but it. But it, it does seem, at least for somebody of my generation, you know, at the end of the, when the wall came down 30 years ago, three, exactly three decades ago, um, you know, there was this, the countries of Central Europe, Poland, exited That's the good. Soviet Imperium, they became free, their citizens could travel, they could express themselves, Freely, they weren't living in a surveillance state such as the one that President Xi seems to be developing now in China. And there was an assumption that the world would, would move in this direction because liberal democracy under the rule of law was clearly and plainly, for all its faults, the better way um, to live and to be for the people of the world. And now you have, I mentioned Xi, um, autocratic models, whether they're in uh, Moscow or in Beijing, um, and you have a tremendous uh, reaction um, toward illiberalism, attacks on the judiciary. We in the United States are the enemies of the people, you know, phrase of pure totalitarian origin. So, so what happened? Was it, I mean, you've worked a lot in the digital sphere. Was it, was it technology that just acted as an accelerator to what President Tusk was describing, this, you know, demean and attack and hate. Well, now you can do it instantaneously, right? So, is technology to blame? Um, yes and no. So, I, I see three failures, particularly given the work that I've been doing. Yeah. One is the transformation of elections, uh, and to use the language that was raised before, into a war. It's like a winner-take-all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the nature of how you contest, and we're seeing this particularly in Africa where our leaders are getting smarter about the checkbox, right? There was some form of 
voting on the day, some form of counting, some form of shady announcement, uh, etc. But you know, mastering the checks and how you contest is being very defined as a war, like you know, it's us or them, and that's one big problem. And technology has then just amplified that because it's much easier to amplify those narratives of us versus them. I think, too, in the euphoria, we never questioned in the early 90s and 2000, and particularly, again, in Africa. I mean, it's really interesting, you know, you hear about the history of political organization in ancient Greece. I wonder, what was the history? Are we taught in Africa the, how we organize ourselves politically uh, hundreds of years ago? It's like our history started in 1963, and there was colonialism, 1993, there was democracy, and now we're in a crisis. And this asking ourselves, how have we historically organized ourselves and questioning whether the institutions we have now are fit for purpose is a big gap. Um, and unfortunately, and you're seeing this with Brexit, technology makes it very hard for consensus. And so where a lot of these issues would be addressed in some back dark rooms, with Boris and some cigars and whiskey and you negotiate, it's all very transparent. Almost maybe too transparant, we should be asking. Where, so where does consensus happen when every decision... Is this why traditional political parties have collapsed? I would say because everything is being scrutinized. I mean, every society is disintermediated, to use, a Harvard, and, to and use a Harvard phrase. So and technology be, as well. So Trump does yeah. not need to, he comes right. onto Twitter. Yeah. And that's how he engages. And so, so do we need to just accept that democracy, the way I lived it during most of my that's over. It's over. That's history. It's we over. may be nostalgic about it, we may like it, we may love it, uh, and we certainly care about its essential values, you know, we respect, dignity, decency, blah, blah, blah. But then, so how, if that's, you know, rest in peace, how do we, how would you reinvent it? I mean, you worked for Google, you... You're, you're right on the cutting edge. I mean, tell us, how do we do it in this brave new world? I think one of the things populism is asking for, and I think which democracy, as we have yeah. known it, or we have nostalgia fulfilled to answer, is what does a good society look like yeah. uh, in a democracy? Do no evil. Do no evil, but also deliver on public goods. Yeah. The social, it's a contract. Mm. And we've asked the people to vote, to do the right things, obey rule of law, but again, certainly in my region, there's a question of what, what is this doing for us? Uh, South Africa is asking that question. Well, the bond freeze are saying high unemployment, struggling education, failing public services. You know, in Kenya, you're basically, you self-provide for everything. So if we're to commit to democracy as a form of government, what are we getting back? This, this, the social contract needs to be addressed. And populism or the China model or Modi's variation, certainly for hundreds of millions of people, is addressing some fundamentals. And we can't, might not like how they're going about it, but I think that's an open question of how do we then deliver public goods and on the social contract. Do you think the main issue is an economic issue or a values issue? I mean, do you think the people who've been drawn toward populist parties, it's, it's the growing degree of inequality in societies, or it's the feeling of being invisible, of being alienated from this metropolitan connected elite and just there being a total imbalance of regard and of visibility and, and of values. You know, you're, you know, you're talking about LGBT plus and gay marriage and, you know, frankly, we're trying to make it to the end of the month. So, you know, is it cultural or economic, in your view, the main source of alienation? I think it's... I'm, I'm going to cop out here. I don't know what the rest yeah, of Yeah, well, maybe is. you have some... Yeah, the, yeah. the aspect of uh, the social contract, I think, is very dangerously neglected. In other words, what the people themselves, on behalf of whom, you know, this marvelous um, institution, this methodology of governance or relationship has been created, invented, the people themselves, that if they feel that democracy is not rewarding, then they become, and I'm talking about materially, and of course I'm not talking about being rich, I'm just talking about day to day, the yeah. ability to survive. Then of course, they become available 
for anti-democratic forces, especially of the millenarian type, focused upon mostly by religious fundamentalist tyrants who then exploit this discontent. So democracy has an obligation also to democratize resources, uh, social opportunities, um, beliefs, etc., etc. Otherwise, we're really throwing the populace to the wolves. And that's what's happening on the continent. That's what's happening in my Nigeria with Boko Haram. Well, in your, Haram, own, in your own country, ISIS, in Nigeria. Etc. Mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, these are the foot soldiers mm. of the religious fundamentalists mm. who, at least, there's something about them. They're honest. They have no time for democracy. And they say it. And so, at least, the enemy is, is clear from that it's, point of it's view. It's visible, yeah. But then they hold out very attractive uh, promises to unformed, uh, non-historic minds who are content with very short-term advantages, day-to-day, -day, you know, feeding, family, etc. So democracy has this enormous responsibility, and I think that should be one of the conditions when eventually the UN gets around to setting down the rules for democracy this has to be... You think that will core. happen one day? Eventually. <laughs> Maybe Annika will. I, I know, yeah, I'm looking yeah, at that. Yeah. She'll take that message yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the cardinal, it's the, the, the basic issues, you know, for governments. Mm -hmm. And then, if I may just add, we're talking about people now. Sometimes the demos itself is its own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I noticed somewhere on the program something about, for instance, the um, the the effect, the maleficent effects of the democratization of information, internet, the blogs, the, the identity abuse, uh, which of course... But of uh, course all this was hailed initially as a great liberating force. We were all connected, look at the Arab Spring, the way it came about, um, and there was an assumption really that these technologies on balance would be more liberating than imprisoning. Um, yes, the optimism, I'm afraid, has been dashed by the users. You would say it's dashed? Yes, the optimism has been dashed. This technology... You don't think there's still a case to be made that it's, fundamentally, it's, nevertheless, this hyper-connected world mm -hmm. has to be a freer world than say, the closed systems of 20th century totalitarianism. Yeah, it, it has, it will be. Mm -hmm. It will be, but it's got to be controlled. Right. We have a situation where we're changing tyrants. Mm -hmm. One little twerp can sit down and... I haven't heard the a, word twerp a, for a, a long time. Twerp, a yeah, good, yeah. Yeah, an, <laughs> internet, an internet twerp. Yeah, okay. You know, a non th an unthinking, unconscionable twerp can sit down at that machine and start right. the next world war. Right. I exaggerate a little, but when you read some of the material which comes yeah, this out is a theme, of this, Magdalena's, that's Ma right. Ma Ma yes. Yeah, can, yes. um, talk, talk to us about yes. hatred in yes. Poland. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I would yeah. like yeah. to uh, agree with you fully that um, I mean this, this um, I mean the internet and funda fundamentalist and populist. It's the most dangerous weapon we we ever we ever had. And the other thing is that they um, use um, this weapon uh, without control, and they speak about freedom of the expression and freedom of the speech on their lips, and with this they, they really are committing a murder on our, on our democracy. Tell me, why, why has this culture of hatred, of conspiracy, and again, President Tusk was talking about this. Why the whole conspiracy theory about the Smolensk accident in, in 2010, that it was all a plot, you know, that, that, that Lech Wałęsa and Solidarność, that all this was, you know, not what it seemed to be, and in, in fact was, you know, the freeing of Eastern Europe, but was just a means to pass power to those who were in with the Communist Party. You know, why has this culture of hatred arisen so virulently in Poland and, and, and indeed led to the, to the murder of your husband? 
Well, I, I think there are uh, several factors. Um, so, um, as you said, after uh, 1989, uh, we were uh, very happy with our freedom. We uh, were, some people went to politics, but um, many Polish people started to make career, uh, were thinking about their economic standards, and we and then uh, Poland was so-called Green Island. Our economy went well, but somewhere in the middle of me, for, we forgot about values. Uh, we forgot that, uh, that um, before we didn't have freedom, that we didn't have passports at home, that we couldn't travel. And then when the people have all of this, they just, you know, concentrate of their self being egoistic. So this is one reason uh, that if they didn't uh, thought about um, values, um, they started to um, dehumanize, dehumanize their, um, what they do, you know? Mm. So it's first. Then the second factor was, was small Smolensk. Um, I mean, uh, at, at the beginning, when someone told me that, you know, that there is a story um, uh, among the people that uh, it was not a catastrophe, but it was the, it's the Tusk is guilty and Putin together, I mean, I couldn't believe uh, how, the, how, how people and that, that were wise people were well educated, how can they tell this story? But it shows... Uh, the, how the social engineering is working. So if you have not truth, half truth, if you have a fake news, but you are telling this thousands of times, uh, if, some, if, if you involve uh, church, if you involve teachers, if you involve uh, national TV, which is very popular, and the, controlled the, by the yeah, and law and justice and, party. And under yeah. control, the fake news started to be real news. And this is how... I mean, in Poland, there are very few immigrants, and, and those that there are come mainly from Ukraine. So how come xenophobia works in a country where there's really no issue? I mean, it, it's, it's myth-making. And mean, yet, it functions for the law and justice party, right? And indeed, you could even link it to, you know, your, your, uh, your, your late husband e embraced these values of solidarity. And they were the last words that passed his lips before somebody put a dagger in him five times. So how does this myth-making become reality? <laughs> as, as, as I told you, you know, so uh, if you use this social in engineering one of, uh, of the factors that it's really uh, working on, on people is to scare them, you know, to make them to have, uh, like, enemies. So before uh, last election, this enemy for Poles, they were migrants, and the leader of now governing uh, party um, tells they bring diseases and, and can steal our jobs, and they are really danger. And now we they have bring disease. Disease, yes. Okay. And now, and now we have another uh, another enemy, which is the uh, LGBT uh, society. Yeah. So, so now uh, we have another enemy. So, as I told you, if mm. if they use the the social engineering, telling the people, scaring the people. So, if the people are scared, they do what you what and, you and want. What? So, yeah. they vote. How do you want? So, you can change even the their minds. So um, they change their decisions. And linked to the xenophobia is this, this kind of crazed nationalism, you know, America first, Hungary first, uh, Poland first. Uh, you know, in Poland there was even a law, I think it's been modified slightly, but you know, you cannot suggest that any Pole during World War II ever in any way collaborated with the Nazis or committed any crime against the Jewish population. We all know about Yed Vabne. We all know thousands of Jews were burned in their home. I mean, it's been documented for a long time. And yet, you know, and obviously the Polish people also suffered immensely. It's complicated. But to have a law that says to say that, you know, any poll was anything less than perfect during World War II, it just seems extraordinary, isn't it? 
It is. It is excellent. <laughs> Good. I'm glad we agree on that. <laughs> I mean, so where is, what is the source of this nationalism? Poland wanted to be part of the EU. It wanted to be part of... It wanted to fuse its identity with the West, that beautiful but imperfect thing, the West. You know, the West was the dream, but somehow that dissolved, right? Yeah, yeah, some, somehow now uh, it's changed, but you know, um, only, only uh, maybe 30% of people, uh, or exactly 18% of people, choose law and justice, justice in last election. Uh, who was guilty? The guilty were the people who uh, didn't vote. So we cannot um, generalize, generalize that all the Polish people are nationalistic because we have a big opposition. And now I strongly believe that um, people who, uh, who are wise and, and Poles are really wise will go voting. I can see that people are really... Poles are very wise. Yes. Okay. And I, I, I can see that they, you know, like uh, are waiting in blocks mm. and I hope on 13th yeah. they, they go voting. Yeah, I, w great. I will vote here in Athens. Oh, so, great. Yes, yes. So, so I hope, you know, they choose different. Um, okay, I'm just going to go. I, I, I might take a question or two from the floor if you have one, but I'd just like to ask one final uh, question, which is this. Starting with you, Ori. I mean, if you could do one thing or launch one program, let's say, that would um, reinforce democracy, not perhaps the democracy that we've had that I firmly believe is not coming back in that form. I mean, we're in transition. We're in some uncharted territory, which doesn't make the values any less important. But so what... What, what, would, what would you propose? What would you do? What would you like to see? And then I'll ask each of you that same question. Sure. Um, maybe two things. Yeah. Um, one, you're asking why nationalism or this yeah. affinity fear, uh, you know, for a long time it was tribalism in Africa, but we're realizing tribes are everywhere in some shape or form. Um, it's very attractive because it's easy. It's, it's less work. <laughs> uh, to rail up yeah. uh, uh, the other rather than uh, uh, provide them an affirmative vision. And I think what we're missing is to embark on this project of re redefine what we are for beyond sort of the basics of freedom of expression and rights. I think this question of a social contract and the delivery of public goods. You know, for a long time, the liberal democracy was just about rights very divorced from how do you live in a day-to-day -day world. Uh, and certainly that's how it was brought into Africa. You know, forget that the role of the government is to work on universal health care, is to provide decent public education, is to provide a baseline um, for, you know, a good life and not just about rights. So uh, this affirmative vision for democracy is one. I think to technology, uh, a lot of these platforms were built on the presumption that human beings are fundamentally good people. <laughs> Dangerous assumption. Very, and, and we're, we're not. Uh, and we liked it when Obama was doing his organizing, we loved it, we thought it was great, he was mining data and all of that stuff. And Trump just took it to the next level and then suddenly we didn't like it. Uh, we wanted everyone to be on the internet, and then we're like, oh my god, actually not everyone on the internet. Uh, we, you know, wanted... Like, what do you mean Trump just took Obama to the next level? What did. do you mean by that? His, his, his data mining... I'm not sure the former president would like that. <laughs> uh, in terms of his use of data and okay, targeting, right, right. and the number of ads, and, and the type of campaign that he, he, he ran, was um, yeah. next level. Cambridge Analytica was in Kenya first in 2013 yeah. and refined their tactics in Kenya before they came to Brexit. Um, and when we were all trying to raise awareness about that, people were like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Until it was done in Europe, everyone was like, whoa, whoa, we don't yeah. like this. So I think rethinking the rules of the platforms to 
just deal with the fact that we're not human beings and not And should Facebook, good. Google, etc., do that themselves, or should it be imposed on them by the Congress or by, I, by I legislation? I think it's time for regulation. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, then. I would like to build on what, what uh, uh, proposals and yeah. uh, uh, recommend it, a two-pronged uh, approach, uh, stick and carrot, if you like, or more accurately, mass enlightenment and sanctions. And sanctions against the individual enemies of democracy. Mass uh, enlightenment, including, as far as I'm concerned, aerial bombardment, of uh, bastions of anti-democracy. Bombardment with educational material, not <laughs> the other kind of bombardment. Okay. I was worried. Uh, and, <laughs> and the sanctions, because it's individuals and a small circle, elite uh, circle of those who feel they are the chosen, who are usually the greatest and worst agents of, um, of democracy, and such should be identified, including their circle, their families, because the families profit. You have a situation under a dictatorship, for instance, when you had not just the, um, the president, the dictator, you had the first lady, then you had the first daughter, and you had the first son with letterhead and everything, and of course, first son in law. Around, first son in law. You know, I mean, calling cards, first yeah. this, first yeah. that, first yeah. grandmother, yeah. Right, grandfather. Yeah. And so, the circle of sanctions, you know, until the members of the, that tight circle are proven innocent by their what actions. What do you mean by sanctions? Innocent of participation. What kind of, what kind of sanction? In the dictatorship. Hmm? What kind of sanction? I mean, what do you mean oh, by sanction? Oh, you know, they love foreign watering holes, most of these dictators. Uh, so see. you refuse to grant them until they become confined mm -hmm. to their little bunker. And so we've identified, on one hand, religious fundamentalism. Everybody knows where that stands. Right. But the other enemy I've mentioned is the, the people themselves who abuse the instruments mm -hmm. of democracy. Sanctions also should go against them, and it should be a collaborative thing amongst all nations. Mm -hmm. Let me just quickly uh, end up by saying that we're not talking in the abstract, and I think by now we know that, as a blog. There's a blog, it's called SB Blog on internet. It says, welcome to SB Blog. And this blog is dedicated to education, entertainment, research, job uh, opportunities, opportunities, etc., etc. And one of its constant um, spreadsheet is titled 40 Famous Quotes from Professor Wale Shoyinka, 40. Out of the 40, 27 are totally false. I'll give you the details of that, if you like. You can access it yourself. Right. Now, that's quite an, that's quite an average. Well, that, I mean, let me, 27. Well, we have to close, but let me, one word we haven't uttered, I think, in this whole discussion is truth, truth. Yes. You're a writer. Um, how, if truth is undermined, if truth ceases, to be understood or respected, or the very idea of it is mocked, what chance do our societies have? What sort of what? What chance of survival do our societies have if truth as an idea dies? Yes, truth can be stressed as much as you like, but there are dedicated uh, corrosive agents of truth. Those who, for some reason or the other, it could be a psychological warp, I have no idea. It could also be a sense of power, because we're talking of the axis of power and freedom, all this. Just what a dictator feels, power over others. So does this, I used the word twerp earlier, so does this little creature who's sitting in front of his or her laptop and disseminating falsehood, it feels a sense of power over the rest of the world. Right. And that power somehow has got to be eroded, it's got to be punished, and that individual has got to be taken out of circulation, not in the way my legislative house wanted to do it at one time in Nigeria, when they decided to decree death penalty for hate you know, and false fake news. The president has never signed it. He had better not try to sign it. <laughs>
Okay. But they did attempt to pass that legislation. Right. But it shows the extent of the desperation of people. Mm -hmm. So now you have those dedicated, structured Democrats now trying to use completely undemocratic penalties against you know, this kind of speech. Finally, Magdalene, if, if, what, yes. what would you do, do to ensure that the terrible thing that happened in, in your life cannot happen and that the values that your husband was expressing at the very last are ennobled, <laughs> are, are no. maintained? So that, that situation pushed me to, to start a, well, international campaign. Imagine there is no hate. And I believe... That's your badge. Yeah, that's right, my yeah. badge. And I believe that the changes of law and sanctions and all of this is important. But shortly, we have to educate people. We have to remind them about the darkest uh, cards of our history, when the democracy was killed, when the authoritarian uh, power... Um, were governing, not to forget about this, and educate, 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 and start from ourselves. Thank you very much. I, I think that's a good note to end on, unless there is time for a question or two, is there? Is, does anyone have a question? I'm told we have one or two quick questions, maybe. Uh, there's a hand up there at the back. Can we get a mic and there? Those two questions. Sorry to everyone else, but does somebody have a mic and can somebody see the... There was one question. Yeah, and one here. Yeah, okay. Brad Fredericks with survivingcapitalism.org. Um, I'm curious to ask you what you think the interaction of capital markets or capitalism is against democ democratic governments? The question is about capitalism. Is it good for democratic governance? Is it inherently, I'm interpreting a bit, inherently inimical to um, democratic governments? What about this capitalist system? We, I'm going to call on you, Ori, to answer that. Um, I think it certainly raises the question of the growing inequality um, there's an interesting chart showing how billionaires, I think, in the U.S. are paying less tax. Yeah, it just came out. Billionaires, yeah. for the first time in American history, pay less tax than workers, than factory workers, for example. Yeah, so they, I think... So it, how, how is that right? <laughs> so it's, I think, I'm not in the eradicate billionaires camp, but I think the questions of growing inequality yeah. certainly tie into the ones I've raised around the social contract. Uh, so another interesting thing to ponder, though, is, is China is realizing if they had just practiced soft capitalism all along, they'd be ahead. Um, and they didn't have to mess around with uh, communism. So I think the questions, you know, China is certainly providing interesting examples of balancing and what they're doing with their money and using their soft power, um, which is from capitalism. For instance, the NFL recently, uh, two days ago, uh, and, the, and the role of that. So I, I think for me, capitalism the is... The NFL, could you clarify that? Uh, for the sorry, audience? not NFL, NBA. The NBA, yeah, yeah. You, you know, China has been spending a lot of money on soft power um, coming out of the experiments with capitalism and now control uh, Hollywood, uh, the NBA. They have to retract a statement on Hong Kong two days ago. Uh, certainly they're investing a lot in TVs and uh, across Africa, TV stations, uh, mobile markets. And there's something really interesting going on there in their approach. Everyone fears kind of their colonial, you know, they're taking over Africa. But are they using capitalism against democracy or Yes, it? they are. I would say so, right? They are. Yeah. And, and so that's an interesting contradiction. But I think for me underlying that, is, is the, the role of capitalism as it's practiced today with fostering inequality and, uh, and those two go together with then sort of people feeling that they need a more controlled environment. At the same time, there's a very strong movement towards sustainable investment. There are companies coming together to say that the sustainability of the planet or some other values have to have as much 
uh, importance to stakeholders as purely profit and so, so there is some there is some movement some I think good. we the, have to the move questioning on questioning of yeah. the shareholder yeah. supremacy right. yeah. Yeah. yeah next uh, there was another question over there um, could you please stand up yeah thank you sorry it's hard to see from here is there a mic for this for the lady here please thank you um, in relation to truth uh, my name is Nazanin Ansari from Kehon Life. Um, in relation to truth, what is truth? Uh, certainly the Greeks and in old mythology, uh, a dodecahedron, 12-sided, was a symbol of the truth. And so I think going forward with all this information, certainly it might be very, um, we're in an uncomfortable position as far as who has uh, the monopoly of the truth. But going forward, thanks to all the great, brilliant minds that we are here, I think the future is not bleak. And at the end of the day, I think one of the things about democracy, we have to distinguish when we speak about democracy. Are we talking about democracy as a form of government, or are we talking about democracy as a process? And I think what is important is the process, Thank rather you. than having a democratic republic. So we Thank have you. a simple last question, which is, what is truth? Um, uh, of course, in the United States, a lot of the country believes that President Trump is clearly the most mendacious um, president we've ever had, but a lot of the country believes he's the most honest, most truthful president because he tells it like it is and he does what he said he would do. So half the country thinks he's the most truthful and half the country thinks he's the least truthful. Well, I'm going to turn to you. Um, what is truth? Well, <laughs> it's... Um, one of my favorite um, limericks, yeah. you know, um, I think it's from the 18th century, is, um, it goes this way. There was a faith healer of Deal who said, although pain isn't real, when I sit on a pin and it punctures my skin, I dislike what I fancy I feel. <laughs> <clears throat> and for me, <laughs> that, you take that side by side, <laughs> With Tiano Boca's uh, definition of truth, um, um, uh, the sage of Bandiagara in Mali who says, there's my truth, there's your truth, and there's the truth. And that's, that the truth is right. what we are all yeah, constantly right. chasing. But one undeniable, indisputable truth is that when I sit on a pin and it punctures my skin, I dislike that truth I fancy, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.